Here we are. Welcome, everybody. It is Friday night, and we are live with Airway Circle and Dr. Cotlow. Welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for inviting me. I'm looking forward to this for quite a few weeks now. Oh, that's awesome. Well, I'm first going to introduce Dr. Cotlow, and I do want to remind everyone and we are a few minutes behind, so whenever we ask a question, if people don't answer right away, it's because they haven't heard it yet. So you might see just not before logging in. So um, anyways, if you would like us to know who you are, a lot of times we can't see your name, it just says Facebook user. So you can type your name for us. Um, something else that I'm going to ask is if you're here live listening to us, type the word simply. Simply Breathe, and we're going to get you a coupon for Simply Breathe strips. Um, I would like to know who is here live so you get that perk. So let's go ahead and start. Dr. Cotlow, since 1974, Dr. Cotlow has been in private practice serving the specialized needs of children. Dr. Cotlow is known throughout the country for his innovative techniques and caring manner and has lectured for some of the top dental societies and dental companies. Dr. Cutlow has lectured in Australia, Taiwan, Canada, England, France, and throughout the United States concerning pediatric dentistry and lasers. He has written over 35 articles and authored chapters on pediatric dentistry and lasers for three laser textbooks. If I were to tell you guys his accomplishments, honors, and the organizations that he's you know, a member of, we would be here. For a long time, so we're just gonna go ahead and get some midnight. <laughs> and my elf here with us today. Um, thank you for being here, girl. Uh, Dr. Cotlow, we spoke a few weeks ago and uh, about a topic, and there's so much that we want to share. Um, I do want to ask everybody if you guys have questions, please type the questions. We're gonna open for questions in about 20 30 minutes. Um, so we decided to start with tongue ties. Why do other medical professionals ignore what we do? So the floor is yours. Well, it's an interesting question because every time I lecture or every time that I happen to listen to an airway lecture, the comment is always the same. Why doesn't the medical community join in with us? And there is no real answer because in my own practice, uh, I, I see some days six to 12 or more babies or even older kids up to 18 who are significantly tongue-tied and uh, they show five, 10, even 15 different signs of obstructive sleep apnea in their airway. And no one out there in the medical community ever looks at the tongue to see maybe that should be part of the differential diagnosis. Now. We fill out the forms, we send them to the doctors. You know, I've got kids who are on NG tubes and within 48 hours, the parents pull the tube out because the kid is now eating and breathing. Do you ever get a call back from the GI doctor? No, never. So it's gotta be a two-way street. Uh, I think in dentistry today, we are merging much closer to medicine because the things we do are all related. And I could give you, you know, airways, breastfeeding, uh, postpartum depression, uh, tooth decay. Uh, there's about 12 different things here, in the endocrine system. I mean, when I see women coming into the office who are depressed because they haven't bonded to their baby because they've been told how wonderful nursing is gonna be and breastfeeding, and they're shocked because they're in pain and agony. And I, many of these kids, these parents, I can fix in 30 seconds. And, and, you know, it's, it's a team. Uh, and sometimes the problem with the team is to, there's too many members of the team who are undereducated. OK, uh, I, I've got kids who come in and they've seen pediatric dentists, general dentists, pediatricians, ENTs, many lactation people. And, and it all starts with the idea people want to compensate for a problem. So rather than trying to find the source of the problem, what they end up doing is they try to treat the symptoms 
Reflux is another one. Okay, it's air induced. Are you getting feedback from me? By any chance? It's perfect. Okay, uh, you know, so many kids come in on drugs which are not recommended for reflux in kids, and they don't have reflux. They have air induced reflux. So it, it's weird in a way that as a dentist, I'm I'm involved with evaluating all of these different medical problems. And not every time, but many times, releasing the te restrictive tethered oral tissues takes care of the problem. Now, that means we also include what I call in my, my area, those lactation people and body workers and myofunctional therapy who are educated into how to work as a team. And it's not just the medical community. There are too many people out there who think that they're the most important part of the team and they don't know anything. So you, you first have to look at the symptoms. Then you need to know how to do an exam. And that's where the breakdown begins. The physician, ENT, and even many, many other members of the team look at the baby in the mother's lap and they look down, <coughs> excuse me, and they don't get their hands in there. They don't see what's going on. <clears throat> and because they don't do that, they miss all of the oral tissues that are restricted. And it's interesting because um, a while back, I realized everybody's out there lecturing on tethered oral tissues. Now, that makes me think people don't know what they're lecturing about because every one of us has tethered oral tissues. By definition, a frenum is going to be tethered to prevent motion of a muscle or whatever they're attached to from moving in the wrong direction. So we need to change two terms. One is stop talking about TOTS, tethered oral tissues, and add an R. And that is we're talking about restrictive tethered oral tissues. And what's restrictive for one person may not be for another person. So we, we have to not only look at what's going on, we have to look what can go on down the line. Okay, when you come in with what I classify at one, two, three, and four ties, you know, class four ties all the way to the tip, that's going to affect speech, airway. It's not just for breastfeeding, but it would be, you know, we see kids twice a year. Uh, I want to see newborns as soon as they're born, but at least by age one. But the, the real key to this is studies are showing that Infants' brains are growing at the rate of 1% per day for the first 90 days. So if we, when I say puts around and don't do anything for three or four months, we're putting that child at risk for behavior problems, antisocial problems. And if it's not taken care of, I, I heard one speaker, and I love the quote. The quote was, we have the ability to intercept and prevent sleep apnea and other problems mm -hmm. when we see children. But when we see adults, we need to treat the results, heart disease, breathing problems, mental disease. So it's, it's a complex problem simply treated in many cases. And I don't want to oversimplify it, but we need to start getting the medical profession to include evaluating the, the restrictive tethered oral tissues as part of any type of differential diagnosis, no matter what it is. And that means they don't have to know how to treat it. A pair of scissors doesn't do you any good. Okay. And we also need to drop the word posterior tie because posterior tie sounds like it's insignificant. Okay. We need to call it, first of all, a distal tie because it's distal to the tip. So we have what people call an anterior tie, but every anterior tie has a distal component. It's like if you do a half a circumcision, that's what I call it, or when you go to the OBGYN and he says, don't worry, you're just a little bit pregnant. What it comes down to, what? Why so many, I don't understand why so many people are so okay with the circumcision, but whenever you talk about, you know, barely doing a phrenectomy on a baby that has amazing benefits incredible you know they're gonna help this child for the rest of their lives so like you said intercept to prevent all of these sleep issues 
why do you think there's still such a stigma about releasing tongue ties? Well, I think it starts with two places, Australia and the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine. Both of the organizations, the Australian Breastfeeding Group and the ABM, Academy of Breastfeeding, have come out with guidelines basically saying lip ties don't exist, buckle ties don't exist, and they talk about problems and complications. Now, I've done over 40,000 laser surgeries. I've never seen one infection, okay? It doesn't mean they're all tongue ties. There are other surgical procedures. But I've never seen an infection, bacterial infection in any patient. I've never seen the hematoma. Now, I know in Australia, they have lactation people hanging out at hospitals waiting for somebody to cut the wrong spot. And I've seen people make a wide incision. They made no incision. I've seen people go to ENT and get charged $2,500 for two millimeters, and they ignore all the other tethered oral tissues that are restricted. So why do they ignore it? Well, in dental school, number one, the tongue is known for taste and maybe as a toothbrush. That's it. We don't learn about airway. We don't learn about all the other things I've talked about when we're in dental school. And I got none of this, I received none of this training when I was in my residency. And I have a statement from the president of the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine that basically says that physicians never get an opportunity to even watch women breastfeed, let alone understand it. So when they're not educated, what happens is they join a practice and it's a bunch of old fogies that have been practicing forever who don't believe it and they pass this knowledge on to the newbies. And you know, even in Albany here, we have the Albany Medical Center. I've offered to train and teach the medical residents and ENT says it's not necessary. They can do all that. <laughs> if it was necessary, we would not be having the discussion. We would not be having the issues that we're having right now, trying to get these providers to understand the importance of this and how to properly do it. I mean, I have a two-hour lecture that started with three slides just on the airway alone and, and the other areas. I mean, whoever thought the endocrine system involved the tongue tie? Okay, but you go back to women who can't nurse and the, the brain tells you produce milk and then ejaculate the milk and it's a cycle. But if you're not nursing and you get depressed and your steroids go up, it shuts down your milk supply. Wow. But no one is looking for the cause. They want to treat. give the baby a bottle. Yeah, it doesn't, exactly. I mean, I can talk for seven hours just like this. <laughs> So, I mean, I'm willing to it keep going. Me, but. It gives me such chills just hearing you talk about this. I'm just thinking back to my son who's sick now. I think I was in the pediatrician's office every other day, engorged. I had mastitis. I had an abscess. I had the postpartum depression. I, I nursed for two years because I, I had to at that point. Um, and it was terrible. And now I'm dealing with a six-year-old with sleep-disordered breathing. And, you know, it's, it's so sad that all of this can be so prevented. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm so happy you're here sharing your, your knowledge. But well, I do have chills just thinking about it. You know, it's every day, though. I mean, I, I saw a, a, a one-year-old the other day. I mean, I see all ages. But this is a one-year-old who her four front teeth are rotted down to the gum. She has decay in her back teeth. Okay, she has, I don't, she's walking around with a bottle in her hand, but the mother couldn't nurse because they told her there was nothing wrong. So here's a child, puts a bottle to sleep with her, so she's got bottle decay. She's got sleep apnea, she's tongue-tied and lip-tied, and they have her on medication to calm her down. She saw a pediatric dentist, she saw a physician, they told her, oh, she's just got bad teeth. I mean, everything this kid, now, whether she truly has sleep apnea, I don't know, because she has four abscess front teeth. Wow. Okay, so I need to remove the teeth. Maybe her sleep apnea is because she's in chronic pain. Mm -hmm. I saw a 14-year-old who is listed, is all, he's got a, a list two pages long of all of his symptoms. When he was 12 weeks old, an ENT snipped two millimeters, and the mother thought everything was okay. 
Now he's got behavior problems, sleep apnea, speech problems, everything. And his tongue is tied three quarters. And it's a big heart shaped tongue tie. So, I mean, this is, this is a difficult case because he's got all sorts of problems. And, and I've got to get him with a myofunctional therapist for a month before we even cut the tongue. And I've got to get him to the right orthodontist because the orthodontist is trying to move the teeth forward in the lower jaw and the upper jaw backward. Oh my so God. It's, it is, it's pervasive within the professional. And I'm not going to just pick on the physicians, you know, medical and dental, because they're taught the wrong information. Mm -hmm. And I, I just don't get I went over to Copenhagen. And I gave a seven-hour course on the tongue ties and everything. They have 535 pediatricians, and each one was sent a request to come. Not one pediatrician showed up over there, okay? And it's the same over here. You can't get the medical community to listen. You don't hear dentists speaking at very often at the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine. And when I first applied, they said, oh, we don't accept dentists. Now they do. But it's it's surprising that we all don't have brain concussions hitting ourselves against the wall and, and swimming upstream because it's just common sense. Listen to the symptoms, include the restrictive tetheral tissues as a part of your differential diagnosis, include the pediatric dentist or family dentist who is knowledgeable and being able to evaluate it. And I also think the lactation people should spend time with their organization and get themselves licensed so that they can make an appropriate diagnosis and get respect from the rest of the community because they'll be a licensed profession. And I think that's part of the problem right there. So we have parts of the breastfeeding team and you know we just had a 10 week airway course, which we, we gave uh, for the Academy of Laser Dentistry. And uh, even the uh, person who was a chiropractor said, within her own organization, 90% of the chiropractors, she said, don't understand what they're doing with the tongues and they don't include it. So I don't know how we're gonna get there, but it's the most commonly asked question in every lecture I hear, how do we get medicine to join with us? And uh, you know, I send them reports. I, I have copies of the surgery before and after, the mother symptoms, the baby symptoms, what we did, how we did it. They'll send them to ENT and put them in the operating room. We can do it in the office in 10 seconds for the upper and the lower and, and no NPO other than for like an hour and a half because I don't want them to vomit if they're gaggers. And, and the, the stories we get from the parents, they're on a $90 a day formula and the mother's on an elimination diet because the child has such poor, such bad reflux. And the tongue is right to the tip. You, mm -hmm. can't, you can't grab onto the nipple, the finger, the pacifier. And as soon as you go near the kid, the baby, they choke and gag. I mean, the symptoms are so simple and obvious. I mean, go to my website, anybody who's listening, and download two forms. One of the forms is sleep apnea. And the other form is new baby symptoms and mother symptoms. And it's kids' teeth, K I D D S T E E T H dot com. And if you really want to get the whole lecture, you can order my book, SOS for Tots. All right. And all I got to do is either go, I wouldn't go to Amazon, I go to my website because you get it faster through my uh, book dealer. And if you really want it faster, call my office because <laughs> my staff mails them out all the time. Perfect. You guys have been so helpful. I'm just getting a message. Somebody says that it's going in and out that the there's almost like a delay on the mic. Uh, so you guys, please, we're going to keep trying to turn the volume down and see if uh, on our end, everything sounds perfect. But um, if it keeps going on, please just let us know. Let me try something. I'm going to unplug my earplugs. Hey, can you hear me okay? We can still hear. It's going to take a couple minutes before they do. So we'll try that and we'll see what they say. Right, let me see what happens if I just use my computer rather than on my earplugs. Okay. They're, they're letting me know over here. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah, um, good. So how old do you see them in your office for tongue tie releases? Well, I'm pediatric dentist. 
mm -hmm. um, busy as I can be. So we really limit in most cases under 18. Uh, I've treated some older kids as favors to other dentists. And, and I don't treat adults, but I have three or four adults I have treated because uh, sometimes I teach lasers for the Leia, and they'll come in on a Saturday and be my guinea pig so I can release their tongue without any local anesthesia. And I, and I have them videotape before and after. It's amazing what they say. Um, but as a rule, I don't do that. I just don't have the, the time. And I always say kids are easy to work on, but not little adults, but adults are big babies and more difficult. Awesome. So you are seeing older children. Um, oh, yeah. And you do use the laser with everyone. Uh, the only thing I use for surgery is the laser. I have nothing else in the office. Perfect. No scalpels, no scissors. And what do you usually do? Uh, you mentioned my functional therapy. Uh, how old do you start recommending that? We're just curious. Well, that's still up in the air right now because I, speaking to Mark Muller, you know, they're, they're trying to lower the age for myofunctional therapy. Uh, I'm not sure where myofunctional therapy, craniosacral therapy, and chiropractors intersect. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, you know, I've got kids coming in with torticollis. Again, not diagnosed. Um, they come in, we put them in the chair, and they look like a little tree. Uh, and they're really tight. They come in very tense and tight. And, you know, how long were you in labor? Oh, it was 24 hours, and the baby was stuck in the birth canal. And they, finally, I had to have a C-section. So you've you got to ask the questions. And it, we just don't. If you've never asked the questions and haven't been taught the questions, it's like watching a mother nurse. People feel, man, eh, that's outside the scope of dentistry. But I need to watch that. And I've only had two women in all the years who didn't want me to watch. Mm -hmm. I would have let you watch for 24 hours to help me. <laughs> uh, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I mean, all the issues that we've been through, I mean, like I'll just mention hers. I also, I had so much pain and for 12 weeks. <laughs> ended up going into PPD because I, you know, didn't even want to get close to him. Every time the baby got close to me, I, you know, I would just completely, I can't do this. It hurts so bad. It's literally the worst pain I have ever felt in my whole life. I don't wish that on anybody. Yeah. And just knowing that something so simple, having uh, a skilled provider around me that could have fixed it, you know, um, would have made the difference in the world. And, all the and I think problems. that's why there's, you know, every myofunctional therapist, I feel like we all have some kind of story <laughs> that has led us into this. Um, yeah. That's well, what I'm passionate about this. It's um, like when a parent comes in and says to me, do you release every tongue tie who walks in the door? And my answer is, if you had a broken arm and you went to an orthopedic surgeon, you would expect something to be done. Now, every now and then, I get someone who comes in because their friends said he better be looked at. But they have no symptoms. They have no signs. Obviously, we're not going to do anything. But my answer is, you're here because you have these symptoms. Exactly. And you want my evaluation as, as to whether I think your tongue and lip and cheeks or whatever are interfering with it. And I show them when I put my finger in there, the baby bites down. You know, they tell me. Uh, on a scale of one to ten, it's a toe curling twenty-one. Uh, and but it's, you know, toe you're, curling, you're, exactly. <laughs> uh, Renata, are you sweating thinking about all this? Oh, gosh, don't even remind me. I don't want to have any more kids, and that's one of the the biggest reasons I don't want to have to go through that again. You know, yeah. I love children. I wanted to have five, and the birth process. Yes, I had C sections, and it was difficult, but. The breastfeeding part, even though I love it and I'm so passionate about it, and it's, I'm such a big advocate, just thinking about going through those first three months again, I don't know if I can handle it mentally. <laughs> but Lori, thank you so much. Lori said that she can hear us very well, and she has a question. She sure. said, what are your golden nuggets, Dr. Kotlow, for successful post-care by parents? <laughs> Is well, she talking about infants? Okay. I think so, I'm not probably, sure. right? Yeah. If you're talking about infants, okay. Um, well, first of all, the consent form that I use says they are aware that after surgery, they need to see the lactation consultant and, if needed, a body work. That's part of the consent. Awesome. Okay. So 
<laughs> you know, I've been doing this for so many years and work with so many other parts of the breastfeeding team. I can give them a lot of information. Now, I know there are a lot of people out there who so don't touch them until we do it. But you know what? If I see a baby with a tie to the tip of the tongue, I'm not going to waste time for the, all the other parts to come together. I think that tongue needs to be released as soon as possible, but still getting the person to the right person. They are aftercare. And, and a lot of times, you know, this is their fourth or fifth baby, and they don't want to spend the money with those companies. So I'll never refuse a parent because they won't follow up. But if they call me and tell me they're having problems, I said, well, I told you you needed to follow up. Exactly. But I would say 90% of the time or better, there's good follow-up. And most of my referrals that are not second or third or self-referral come from body workers and lactation people. And, you know, everybody has got their own personality. And, you know, I lectured once and said, I put together a really good team. And my team really works well. And the person said, well, they're not your team. I said, sure they are. These are people who I trust and I can work with and understand. They're not somebody in left field who's going to say something that's wrong. Um, the, the pearls I, I spend, when you come to my office, first of all, you have your form filled out. So I already know your child just by your symptoms in most cases. Then I'll do an exam. And that's the key. You need to do an exam, not virtually. You've got to put your hands into the baby's mouth, which means the baby's head is in my lap. Mm -hmm. And my fingers are in there. So those so-called posterior ties, which don't exist, pop up. Now, if you understand that 40 to 60% of babies have reflux, and 95% of the time it's due to the tethered tissues, that means we really have almost 40 to 60% of babies have some kind of ankyloglossia, as far as I'm concerned. And I don't care if people agree or disagree. That's what I think. Okay, so then I do an exam. Now, your baby is in your lap, but the head is in my lap. So you're watching, and you can see everything I'm doing, and you can see all the cars. Then I put together 15-minute video, which goes over all of the questions parents ask and how to do it and what the aftercare is. And then I come back and I answer any questions. And if they decide to do it, and if this is your decision, if you want it, then we can do it today. Then we'll do it. And it takes, I tell a parent the child's going to be with me for 10 minutes, but they're usually with me for five minutes. Okay. And my assistant who's the nurse brings it back to the mother now the reason i say 10 minutes is because if i say five minutes and i got a problem they're freaking out yeah okay. we're, we're counting the seconds right. i mean they're why well i only took you three minutes i said okay i can bring the baby back down for another five minutes no 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 so you know i have the baby latch on both sides for about 10 minutes then i go back and i go over the aftercare how to get your fingers in there elevate the tongue it's either a scooping action or a pushing, or I have a tongue blade. Now, there is a new instrument that I'm working on with someone, which I'm getting the prototypes this coming week. And it looks like a groove director, only it's covered with rubber. And um, it's soft, and it has an angle on it, which you can change. And it, it's going to be almost identical to the groove director, but soft. Wow. on the edge so it won't hurt and bendable so you can change your angle um it's going to be available soon if it works the way i hope it to work wow. okay then i i give the parent print out three pages long of the symptoms what we did in the photograph i give her two one for the location of the atmosphere and one for the body worker and then i send it to the pediatrician then i have a letter and I have 10 references, three of which are mine, about <laughs> airways, tongue ties, lip ties, uh, GI problems, and I send that. And if it's a first-time doctor, we send them how to do an exam. And then if they're local, I feed them back in a week to make sure they've been doing the stretches. Meantime, within that week, I want them to see 
for sure the lactation person and if they can, the body worker. So you recommend stretches for them? Yeah. So I, I want stretch. You have if you don't stretch, you got to cut. It's going to heal back together. Now, mm -hmm. if you do what the ENTs do, they cut here. It's never going to reattach because it's only thin mucosa. But as you get back deeper, now the other trouble is people are cutting too deep and too wide. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I've got patients who I can see. They send me photos. You can almost see the linear nerve. Wow. And the whole bottom is cut out. And then they have bleeding problems and they use silver nitrate. And this is the stuff that gets put up onto the internet. Yes. Okay. And I've seen, oh, they use a laser and burn my kid. Never ever seen that if you know what you're doing. So all of these things that these people are writing are contraindications. They're not contraindications because they don't exist if you know how to do the surgery. You know, anybody can have an untoward reaction somehow. But I don't use drugs, I don't use chemicals. We use sugar water for analgesia on the babies. I don't use topical because I don't want them to have it. I don't numb them because I want them to nurse immediately. And once they get above 18 months, usually we'll give them a light sedation. And all it is is Dramamine 50 milligrams. It's for mm -hmm. sickness. That's enough to take the edge off, and it's as safe as any drug can be. But a needle injection hurts more than the laser. Now, depends what laser you're using. If you're using diodes, they're boring. They're going to be more uncomfortable and more chance of collateral damage. And my answer to people who are doing them is, if you're going to do phrenectomies and tonkies on a regular basis, you need to get the right instrument to do it, which means you invest in, to me, I think CO2 is the best, but erbium and CO2 are the two, not the diodes. Um, I use diodes in the beginning. You know, I, I lasers only came into existence in around 1996, and that was the NDA. And Erbium only became available in 2000, really, in 19, 1998, but really in 2000. And then diodes became available after that. And then CO2 is really only the last 10 or 12 years that it's been available in dentistry. So uh, you're choosing the right laser with the right setting. You don't get collateral damage. It heals quickly. Uh, and one of the things I tell parents is, in about four to six hours after surgery, you may have a baby who cries for a minute or five minutes or a couple hours. And my premise is only because I always saw four hours after a laser surgery, the analgesic effect of the laser seems to wear off and the babies start to cry. Mm -hmm. And you can, if they're older than like 18 months or two, you can use Tylenol, but I try to avoid it. Uh, there are some homeopathic stuff, Annika which parents can try it. And uh, there's a few other ones that are by the uh, health food stores. But I give them a solution of one drop of clove oil in 10 cc's of coconut oil, have them shake it up real good, put it in their hand, just rub it into the cut, and we make our own solution. And uh, there's a question here um, for older kids ages one to four, the one to four age range, do you recommend a um, speech language pathologist, feeding specialist or therapist instead of the lactation counselor or specialist? So I guess the question is speech therapist, feeding therapist, ages one to four. Uh, it really depends on the problem. I'm not so sure I need a speech, a speech person involved with a child under the age of two, although there are some. I know I always my granddaughter didn't really speak until she was 23 months. Now she's nine. I'm ready to take the tongue back down to her. I think that the main question was if they're not breastfeeding anymore, so we're still going to send to a body worker and do you send to anybody else? Well, if they're getting to me now, it's usually because of sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. And uh, depending on which age, I would say the body worker or the myofunctional therapist is going to come into play more often after age two. But, I, you know, when I a child coming in, I don't just put them in a chair and look at them. I watch their gait. I watch how they react. I mean, I had a baby yesterday who was 
two and can't speak, but he's gibberish. And I said to the parent, have your, have your child ever been evaluated for autism? No, no one's ever mentioned it. And I'm not afraid to tell a parent. And I've got letters from parents. They insisted they be evaluated and they found that they were on the spectrum. So, you know, my job is not to make the diagnosis, but if I see something that I don't think is right, I'm going to refer them to a physician who specializes in behaviors. You know, my staff is pretty good. Uh, three of my hygienists have been with me between 30 and 40 years. My assistant's 43 years. So they know really what to look for when they're doing their cleaning and stuff. So it's a, it's a, my office staff knows what to say to me when I go and sit down and look at it and to evaluate. So the, the older child, it really depends on how articulate they are, what I see as the problem. Most of the time in a one or two year old, it's going to be behavior from sleep apnea. Uh, so it, it really depends. Most of my referrals are going to be to more functional therapists, chiropractors, body workers. Obviously, if they're not nursing, a lot of a lot of lactation people won't see a baby who's not nursing. Mm -hmm. So you know, maybe we talked about it with Autumn that it's also important if a baby uh, is or if a mom is pumping exclusively pumping or just even doing formula, and they the baby is still having issues with the bottle and still clicking, they can still see a lactation consultant because they are baby feeding specialists. So they don't do only breasts. It's important for moms to know that. You can go to like this consultant if your baby's having feeding issues feeding. It's okay if you're not nursing. Um, they can agree. help, especially, I mean, if they have issues feeding from a bottle, they're still gonna need a tongue tie release if the tongue tie is the issue. So it's important for you to follow up with a professional who specializes in that to make sure that they can help you um, with the process. And me specifically, my functional therapist, I don't see anybody until usually age five and up. Um, like we were speaking in another uh, conversation, usually my functional therapy, they have to copy what you're doing. And right. children younger than five, a lot of times cannot. Once in a while you get a, a three and a four year old that, you know, uh, like mature, have yeah, all the siblings. Like yes, I mean, even with my one year old, he copies what I do, you know, but I can't really call him myofunctional therapy. Um, he will, he'll click his tongue, he will do certain things when I do it. Um, but I feel like sometimes, you know, we just get lucky. I couldn't charge somebody for therapy and just hope that he's telling you. Mm -hmm. Well, for the older kids, you know, the, the two year old to maybe five year old, uh, what I have them do is if they'll mimic the parent, stick their tongue out, lift them right up and down, I find either peanut butter or non-peanut butter in the palate. Yeah. Lick it, mm -hmm. tell them to get a shot glass, mm -hmm. get something in it and have them lick it, uh, or even a beater blade with some frosting on it. So there's a couple of ways, and these are ideas parents have given me over the years. Mm -hmm. yeah. And these are things that we can tell your children. There are certain things that you can do with your child to get them aware of You're coming in and out. Your voice is coming in and out. Uh -oh. I we can't, can't hear you. Hear, you. Can you hear me at all? Now I no, can. can. When you back it's up, I can. Internet. I think it's just my internet. Um, but it's, it's probably going to get better now because I turned my phone off. Um, but anyways, it's uh, and I know that some speech pathologists can help children on that age gap from the the time that they are no longer drinking formula or, or breastfeeding um, up to four or five when they can see a myofunctional therapist. A lot of these children who are tongue-tied will have some oral motor issues or they will have feeding issues. You know, most of the kids, they're really tethered. They cannot lateralize the tongue. Um, they have difficulty swallowing. Uh, they will avoid certain textures. Um, so at that point, you know, I usually recommend them seeing a speech pathologist or an occupational therapist who is specialized in feeding. Um, if, you know, that little gap that we don't have a, an IPCLC and uh, they can see a myofunctional therapist. Well, keep in mind, we're talking about 
why pediatricians don't understand what we do. But the same thing, unfortunately, was with a lot of speech. I get kids who come in and they've had three or four years of speech mm -hmm. and, and they're tied. Okay, so again, I need my team who I trust to work on it because there's too many people who should be part of the team that aren't educated into how to do an exam and they try to compensate for a pr problem which is a physical anomaly which is easily corrected and then they can work with me training the time um so you know it's 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 a frustrating thing you know i can talk to the two of you all day long because you know what we're talking about but when you see a patient coming into your practices who is tongue-tied and they've had all sorts of treatment for a year or two then you, you become as frustrated as the parent for seven years and then they just graduate <laughs> Exactly, they graduate. <laughs> because and then the parents are like, but nothing's changed. But I just graduated. Yeah, I know. I see the new study that just came out about the, um, I think 80%, uh, they found out that about 80% of children who have speech issues have a uh, tongue tie. You know, if you I watch the news, <laughs> CNN had a big article about three years ago. A five year old went to a pediatric dentist. And she discovered he had a tongue tie and he couldn't speak. And when she released it, he started speaking. Yes, I, I've seen that. Okay, it is so oh, my goodness. My impression is that's malpractice. For five years, they didn't discover it. It was there. there. They misdiagnosed it. Or they, didn't, they ignored it. And so when we, we get into these terms and people look at it, things don't develop when you're tongue tied. It doesn't all of a sudden show up. That baby should be examined by a competent IBCLC who is not doesn't have their hands tied behind their back by the medical community. Thank you. They don't have a gag on their mouth. So that baby, so I have a flow sheet, okay? And the flow sheet says, when that baby is born, it was right on the mother's chest. But within a few hours after they meet each other, someone just has to look. And depending upon what they see, they give the parent my sheet. These are symptoms. If they start to appear, you need help. Now, I had one mother, it was her third kid, okay? And it was right to the tip of the tongue. It was a home birth, and they were two blocks away. The baby was in my office at one hour old. Okay? Wow. It was a class four tie to the tip. The mother wanted it done. I saw the baby and held it before she did. <laughs> well, up to that time, it was my granddaughter, which was 24 hours. But wow. no one's going to be in an hour unless they deliver in the office. Um, but it, it all comes down to education, education, and education, not ignoring and ignoring. Definitely. And there are so many professionals out there that say, oh, my goodness, don't release the tie first. You have to see body work. You have to see this. You have to see that. My gosh. <laughs> As soon and as my baby was born, I knew I couldn't make it. I knew I was not going to be able to nurse him. I mean, he cut me the first time that he latched. As soon as he was born on both sides, I knew it was not going to happen. And as a new mom, I mean, you have a brand new baby. You're not going to spend two days waiting to see yeah. a body worker. That's some body work. I mean, you know, if you ever told me that I would be treating postpartum depression and bonding, I look at you and say, where does this come from? Yeah. Okay, so wear many hats. And what I say to parents and what I say when I lecture, there's really nothing in dentistry that you're going to do that will be giving you as much happiness as the parents. And we need to change the idea that breastfeeding is a dyad. It's a triad. Because the baby, the mother... And especially today, you got to look at what's going on with the father. Because if the baby's crying and the mother's crying, father's going to suffer. And I then I, I throw into other things. What about shaking baby syndrome? What about young parents who aren't educated enough and don't know how to take care of the baby? That baby is refluxing, arching his back, 24 hour pain. And the parent says, You got to stop. They're not murderers, but they just don't know. So, and, no sleep. I, and when I asked the pathologist, was the baby tongue tied? They said, What's tongue tied? Yeah. Okay. And then you've got 
all these nuts out there with guns. How many of these, they, they're always anti-social. How many of them didn't bond to their parents? And it went all the way through, it was less than Philadelphia. I have said this for so many years, that we as a country, we really need to start focusing a little bit more on mother, baby, um, that connection. I mean, the United States is one of the only countries in the world that allows six weeks, maybe 12 weeks, and most of the time it's not even paid for you to be yeah. a baby. Shouldn't we be looking at how important it is for this bonding and this nurture and this how important it is for children? These are the kids that are going to be ruling the United States, you know, and, and out there years from now. We are raising these kids. And it's like that old saying, you know, let's raise, what is it? Let's leave. Oh, people say, let's leave a better world to our kids. No, let's leave better children to this world. It needs to mm -hmm. start when they're born. And the amount of comfort and love that we give them. And I'm not saying anybody doesn't give love if you let them cry it out. But it's something that has ha that came about because of World War II. When World War II happened, men were not here anymore. Women had to go back to work. They didn't have a choice. So they no longer could nurse their babies until three years old like they used to. And all of a sudden, a behaviorist came out with all of these articles and all of these books writing that it's okay uh, for you to let your baby cry. It is okay if you can't do these things that you're used to doing. Because, of course, I mean, they couldn't do it. And somebody had to find a way to make sure they didn't feel guilty because of all of this so then this whole movement started of let's get this child um you know the individualized and uh, how do you say it and um let's get this child to be independent as fast as we can you know the whole mentality of getting the kids out of the house as soon as we can getting the kids out of the room as soon as we can getting the kids off the boob as soon as we can um you know and the focus going more on the parents, I, I just feel like this has gone way downhill and several of the issues of mental health that we are seeing nowadays in the United States goes back to a mother who did not, for some reason, or one reason or another, could not bond with that baby properly. Um, and, you know, and so many uh, parents also complain or so many moms complain that the dad is not in with the breastfeeding or they don't have any support. You know, they don't want me to breastfeed outside of the house. They don't want me to breastfeed in front of anybody. This whole stigma around breastfeeding, it really needs to change. And we really, as a community, need to get back together and start giving these moms more time to stay home with their babies. It is so important, not just for one thing, but for our whole community and what's going to happen to, um, our world, you know, after these kids are out there, they need uh, this time with their moms. You can't spoil a child with love. But the other problem is the, in the insurance companies and the physicians, if you go back when my kids were born in the, in the early 70s, okay, everybody got their tonsils and adenoids out, okay, which means the airways were okay. Now, I know when I was in high school, we didn't know about Asperger's. We didn't know about ADD or ADHD. We had kids in our classes who were, they were considered mentally retarded or different. We don't use those things anymore. But what happened was the, the group of physicians and the insurance companies decided too many tonsils and adenoids were being taken out. And then all of a sudden, they stopped taking them out and used antibiotics. Well, that whole group of kids had airway problems that no one treated. And that's all of a sudden, we started getting ADD and ADHD. Now the pendulum has swung the other way around. Now we're removing 80% of the tonsils and adenoids for airway problems. So there's that whole area in there of children who grew up where no one examined their airway and they probably didn't nurse, but they, they, they didn't have an open airway and that's where their behavior problems occur. And everybody put them on drugs. Hopefully the pendulum is swinging because parents don't want their kids on drugs. But it all goes back again to examining the oral cavity to find out if there's restrictive cerebral tissues. And when the older kids come in looking at their tonsils, there's a lot of kids who come in 
um, with enlarged tonsils. And I, I send the parent, you gotta get, you have to get the tonsils now before I can work on your child. He's not a gagger, okay? He gags because anything put in his mouth closes his airway. Mm -hmm. um, but this, this whole thing that you just talked about in bonding, you know, Michelle Emanuel did a whole hour and a half on it in our in our comp, in our discussion group, and you know, it's it's getting to the point where my six and a half hour lecture on our talk is almost going to have to be two days because each one of these topics can't be discussed in three slides, and, and we, you need to educate. It's not just breastfeeding, but all the things we're talking about, and bonding is a huge issue to me. I mean, I talk, the first thing I say to a mother when she comes in, the first thing after I look at the kid, I want you to understand none of this is your fault. So get rid of all your guilt. You've been told you're a new mother. You're told you're over right there. Forget it. This baby has an anatomic restriction, which is preventing them from bonding. And you expected it to bond. So, And they start to cry because I've taken a big rock off of their shoulder. Oh, that big so, I mean, I can feel it. <laughs> but I know I went on a little rent right there. And this is not to to blame anybody who has done things a certain way. What I'm blaming here is the pressure from society that has put mothers in that position that you feel like you have to do things like fathers are telling you to do. Because your your friend or your mother, your mother-in-law or whoever is telling you, no, 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 this, this child has been, you know, nursing too long, or this child has he cannot sleep with you, or cannot do this, or cannot do that. You know what I mean? Just as or they have teeth now. Are you going to stop? Well, I like it when the grandmother says, breastfeeding is not supposed to be pleasurable. It's supposed to hurt. Yeah. <laughs> oh, grandma. <laughs> you know, grandma is like, keep I, you know, the best thing about the COVID crisis is I only allow mothers and fathers with the babies, okay? And I don't allow mothers in the office with the kids when they're getting their teeth cleaned. We keep everybody separate. And we we have two separate entrances now. We only have the babies come in one area and all the other kids in another, so we keep them separated. Because the babies, the, the, the older kids are gonna become the carriers and, and we don't want the babies to, or the parents to get infected. Exactly. Fortunately, the vaccines are becoming better, but, uh, you know, when, when a grandmother comes in with a mother because the father couldn't make it, I want to just close it down. They're the ones who have more questions. But we didn't do that, and we didn't do that. So that doesn't mean it was right. You got to have some lift tape ready to go. Here's yeah. nasal breathing. That's what duct tape is for. All perfect. Oh, my goodness. Guys, this has been an amazing talk. So we are awesome. done. I do want to know if anybody has any last questions, please post your questions. We have Dr. Kotler with us today, who is uh, taking time out of his busy Friday to answer anything we may have. Somebody just uh, mentioned that they're going to share this with their office. So what is that you'd like your office to, to know um, coming straight from one of the pioneers in the field? Uh, people are very excited over here. And Ruth did mention, Ruth is an a occupational therapist. Uh, she said that the bonding reflex was one of the things just discussed uh, at the Feeding Matters Conference. That is so good. So there is a bonding reflex. So do you think the increase of hyperactivity we see has some base in children not getting outside to move their bodies as much as they did back in the day since they're inside in electronics now? Less sensory input leading to decreased slit sleep, or I don't know what you think. What do you think? <laughs> oh, man, that's a loaded <laughs> question. I can't <laughs> answer that. Question. I mean, you can talk to psychiatrists and psychologists, and they're going to tell you, you know, going to bed, watching TV, and watching your computer, the, the blue lights and the red lights and the yellow lights stimulate you and prevent you from going to sleep. They say everybody, including adults, should shut everything off an hour before they want to go to sleep not get into bed and watch TV and then shut it off and think they're going to do it. So, you know, I'm not going to touch that. You want to, you need a psychologist on there. Before, you know, <laughs> Sorry, we're here talking about tongue tie. What, what, I, what I'm here to say is we need to all work as a team, understand each person's position, but each person within that position has the responsibility to be educated and knowledgeable and understand where they fit and when they should be part of it and how soon. 
So we, we need not to look at, oh, you have to do this first. It's look at the structure. If it's to the tip, you can't stretch it. And you've got 90 days to get this straightened out. Okay, I can fix that part of it in, in less than two minutes. Then your job is to work with the mother, uh, making sure she follows up. So, of course, the IBCLC is important. Of course, the body work, the myofunctional scale, the speech, but in the right time. Definitely. And that means they don't spend years doing something to compensate. You don't compensate your ankle glossier. You fix it, and then you work with the structure the way it's supposed to be. Get rid of the word compensate, get rid of, post, rid of posterior ties, and get rid of it's my job first. Look at the structure, look at what the problem is. If it's a class one and two tongue tie, go for it. Spend a week or two with a lactation person. Mm -hmm. But as you said, I know it hurts. I don't want to give it up. I don't want to be in pain work together as a team so the, the other members refer out and say listen we've tried for a few days it's not working we think it's tongue tie we think you should take a look at it and if you think it needs to be corrected go for it but we need to work together in the right time and, and that's the most important thing today we can do it as long as we work as a team and the team members are educated, educated. and i have a question about that then mm -hmm. say that again a myofunctional therapist. There are several of us here who live in um, smaller communities that we do not have um, a, an ENT or a dentist or somebody that is very, uh, you know, skilled to do these procedures. How do we, as either you know, dental hygienists or speech pathologists, who are nobodies, <laughs> whenever it comes to certain, you know, doctors, that's how we feel. We're not nobodies. We're do a lot but we um we you know are made feel this way by so many medical professionals do you have um some advice of how we should approach you know what i've got pediatricians all around me who tell parents all i do is cut to make money and to pay for my laser okay yeah. i can retire tomorrow i've been in practice 47 years I'm not doing this to make money, okay? He's still trying to pay for his laser. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I, they're closed-minded. The only thing you can do is say, I'm sending you this report. Please okay. put it in the patient's chart. Perfect. So it can be documented at a later date if you ignore it. Okay? Because they have to put everything you say in paper on there and into the chart. And, you know, maybe... You know, that's why I send the physicians everything. Sometimes I hear they're thrown in the basket, okay? But I document it in my chart where it was sent to the pediatrician. Somebody's going to come back, and they're going to make a big issue of it. And at that time, it'll become more mainstream. But there's a study that says it takes 17 years for studies to become facts. And I've been doing it for over 20 years, and it's still not fact, okay? So uh, closed-minded I don't know what to tell you. You need to be more forceful and say, look, I don't want to sit and have this patient continue to suffer. We need someone who is going to do this without a pair of scissors and do it completely. And our opinion is these, you know, our suggestion is you can't make the diagnosis, but it's like a nurse saying you have all the symptoms of diabetes. Maybe you should be checked out. Exactly. You have all the symptoms of ankyloglossia and restricted tether all tissues. It needs to be checked out and evaluated properly. And anybody who looks at your baby and doesn't put their head in the lap, get up and leave. Exactly. And I am so glad that you did say something about IBCLCs and they should be seeing the baby first if there's an issue. Because so many pediatricians, uh, and I, I worked at a hospital over here for four months or so with the lactation consultants. Um, I did a little internship with them. And I remember, you know, as soon as I came in, okay, I was like, okay. Tongue ties, tell me, what do you know? What, they were like, oh my goodness, you cannot say that to the mom when you go in. Even if you think there's one, if the pediatrician walks in and the mom said, the like, there's certain things that may be a tongue tie, ooh, that is bad. Like, you can't, so you, because you can't diagnose. But my goodness, how much of this information do they have in medical school? You know, we really need to be a little bit more gracious and a little bit more open and a little bit more respectful uh, for other people's education and expertise 
because if we all work together, and that is why we're here on every circle, we're trying to bring all of these specialties together and to share all this information with you guys so you guys can share um, conversations like this one. So this Facebook Live, please share this on your personal page. You know, maybe you're going to reach a mom that needed to see this, that really needed to hear this. Or well, I'm, always, I don't know. I'm, I'm always ready to give a lecture. And they're Thank all set. You. So, you know. So, and if somebody would like, do you teach professionals how to use the laser? Or how to. Well, with COVID, I don't have people in the office anymore, but I do have a lecture on soft tissue surgery, which covers all of the soft tissue surgery using the laser. Uh, uh, so, what, about, what about any trainings for pediatricians that maybe are open to? Because there are some in my area that are looking into this more. Um, at least they're talking about it. We actually have a pediatric dentist going into uh, a pediatrician's practice and they're going to listen. Um, so I'm so excited for that. But what is there, um, do you have like a training or something for these pediatricians or something that could help them understand more? The well, the first thing is buy my book. Okay. Yeah. Now, yeah. what we do is, and I have lots of dentists who buy the books, I give every patient a copy of my book to read and pass on. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Gemma, you're 100% right, my dear. Um, mm -hmm. I also send every pediatrician who's new a copy of my book. And as I've said, I've got a two-hour course which covers all of the possibilities, symptoms, <laughs> diagnosis and how we do it it's a two, two hours so, i mean i can take any evening and, and give a course any place in the country through zoom uh, if people are interested and, and i don't charge a whole lot to do it um, so that is why that's where we all come in there's 26 people watching this live right now i want every single one of you to hit share and share this on your <laughs> personal page Let's try to make this video that we just had today viral and try to get moms because if we empower moms with this information, they're going to go to professionals and they're going to start asking questions and they're going to want to try to help their kids. So we are here to share this information with you guys, but it's in everybody's uh, responsibility to try to get this message out there with us. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's yeah. my pleasure. Anytime. I'll come on anytime you want. I don't need a lot of notice. <laughs> I, I really appreciate you being here. I really appreciate your time and all your knowledge. Thank you. It's been wonderful. Um, we do have a new giveaway that is going to be announced tomorrow morning. You guys do not want to miss this at 6 a.m. tomorrow morning on our Facebook group, Airway Circle, our new giveaway. Um, so stay tuned so you can answer that. Um, I will share some information on how Dr. Cutlow, how you can get to watch his course and how to get his book. So also on our page, all the information is going to be there. And um, last thing, Dr. Cutlow, if parents want to get in touch with you to schedule a consult, you gave us your email or not email, but the website, right? They can just go on the website. Right. And you can call the office at 518-489-2571. Five one eight area code five one eight four eight nine two five seven one. If someone wants to email me a question, I can't make a diagnosis, but if they have a question, my email is kids teeth at aol.com with two D's. Perfect. They're just supposed to get the phone number for the office over there. Yes. Thanks everybody for being here. This has been a wonderful talk. Next week we have some amazing clubhouses already uh, specific for you guys. We have Tuesday all about fascia. We have some amazing people who are going to come fascia quest. The whole fascia quest is coming to talk to us. Uh, on Thursday, we're going to have a talk about ALF. And on Friday is going to be another incredible speaker. And it's going to be all about breathing. Um, you guys are welcome to guess that one who it is. And we will see you on Tuesday on Clubhouse at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thank you so much. And I want to see at least 26 shares of this video. Let's do it. <laughs> All right, well, thank you for inviting me. And like I said, anytime. Thank, thank you. you. Right. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.